we're going to uh, deviate from the schedule, as I mentioned. We're going to be doing chapter 10 today. Uh, because this chapter is a little bit easier than the Alkenes one, and since spectroscopy is such a difficult topic to deal with, um, it's, uh, I think it's going to be better if we pair it with a, an easier chapter. So uh, this will be on exam three, uh, just like spectroscopy will be. So we're, we're moving the alkenes a little bit differently. All right, so um, let's go ahead and get started. It's not too bad of a chapter. Um, there's really only one reaction, we'll say, and it's uh, uh, there's just many different types of that same reaction we can have. So uh, we're going to see that radicals as we might remember, are unpaired electrons. And so we're going to see that they will uh, come into being when something just takes one electron away, or takes a hydrogen and leaves one electron uh, behind here. Uh, often these... Um, will uh, react to make new radicals. So they just keep on going. So this is why um, in our bodies we have many antioxidant compounds that will absorb free radicals like these and stop them from going to our DNA and using that to make more radicals. So uh, we're going to see that uh, these will kind of just happen when uh, things kind of split homolytically. And good morning. Uh, and uh, we're going to see that they will convince other things to also break apart. So uh, typically speaking, our most like um, basic one, all right, that's F4 iodine is what's called homolytic cleavage. This is the first way to get radicals. So homolytic means the same splitting. So they are going to split such that we end up with technically we have already some lone pairs on these, right? We are going to use single-headed arrows to indicate the flow of radical electrons. So notice we have a radical here. It's unpaired. Unpaired electrons are radicals. And notice we use single hook arrows also called fish hook. So this sort of arrow means two electrons, like a lone pair or something. Something like this means one electron. So uh, when we're talking about mechanism arrows. So if we're using a double-headed arrow, that tells us two electrons are moving. If we use a single one, that's telling us that one electron is moving. And we're going to see here, that's why we've used single arrows, single-headed arrows for this homolytic cleavage example, where we're going to be making two radicals. Uh, we have two whatever halogen these happen to be, chlorines or whatever, chlorine radicals, bromine radicals. We've taken their single bond between them, and we've split it equally. So that single bond was two electrons. If we split it equally, one electron goes to each one. And we now have two species with unpaired electrons. And so those will be able to react later. Uh, we're going to see that we're going to have a number of different types of 
reactions that radicals will do, like kind of um, normal things they'll do. They will take protons away, they'll take halogens away, uh, and they can couple things together. We'll see all the different kinds of things radicals will, will do. Just like where we, before we talked about mechanisms, we talked about nucleophilic attack, loss of a leaving group, we had kind of mechanisms. We're going to have radical mechanisms as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at stability of radicals before we do that. Um, we're going to see that it will be the same trend as carbocation stability. So thankfully for us, those two are exactly the same. We're going to see that methyl and vinyl radicals will be our least sub uh, stable. And then we're going to go all the way up to willowlick and benzylic. Uh, and so these are the least stable radicals, and these are the most stable. Most stable, let's try that again, most stable. This is benzylic, this is allylic, A and B. And as always, you know, tertiary benzylic will be better than secondary benzylic, will be better than primary benzylic, but even so, those are all better than plain old ones. And I remember Kevin had found something on Chegg that had shown the incorrect answer. It had shown that tertiary was better than allylic or benzylic, and that's simply not the case. Here's some evidence for this. I have the numbers here. If we have, actually I don't, they're on some other page. Here we go. A methyl proton, its bond energy or bond dissociation energy for this bond here, the CH bond that would need to be broken in order to form a radical, we're looking at 435 kilojoules per mole. Vinyl's on a different page. So let me go grab that. I have the number on that one. Vinylic ones are 464, so even worse. If we're looking at one of these bonds, this is vinylic. This is a methyl. This is vinylic. 468 kilojoules per mole. Not very stable. These are high energies. We're going to see as we move on, let's talk about secondary. Or rather primary, I guess we have to do that one first. This is a primary one. The bond association energy is about 410 kilojoules per mole. You don't need to know these. Don't worry about them. Just showing you evidence. So as these bond energies get lower, it's easier to break them because you end up with a more stable radical. If we have a secondary one, a secondary radical or CH bond 397, and a tertiary one. Again, looking at the same bond that we're looking at here, that one's going to be 381. And then we have the other ones, allylic ones. So this is even primary allylic. Any one of these, this tertiary, this is the allylic. Primary allylic one is 364. 
But take that check. Boom. Evidence. And then the benzoic. Even again, primary benzoic, we're looking at 356. So, don't worry about the numbers, but worry about what type of C8 bond you have. So, a benzylic one is always going to be much more stable than allylic, more, more stable than tertiary, secondary, primary. Vinylic and methyl are the worst. Vinylic is even worse than methyl, but we generally just group them together as generally not going to happen. So, we're going to see here that if our dear friend, the chlorine radical from before, I guess we had X radicals, what this might do is it might grab a proton. And how the arrows are going to look, we're going to start at the radical. I'm going to make that radical extra big so we can see it. We're going to start at the radical, and what's going to happen for this this sort of uh, mechanism, arrow, is we're going to take the bond between the H and the carbon and split that. And so what we can see here, what's happening, is we are going to break that bond. We have now a radical here. We've broken that single bond to H. And now we've made a new bond between H and Cl. <clears throat> this process, by the way, is called hydrogen abstraction. That would be an example of that type of mechanism, arrow, <clears throat> pretty common for radicals to do. So um, if we go ahead and look at this, we see, again, we have a radical from chlorine kind of grabbing the hydrogen. So one of the bonds from the CH or one of the electrons from the CH bond goes to pair with the chlorine. Only well, needs one electron because it already has one, so it just needs one more, leaving one extra electron, which now is just going to chill on that carbon. And because it's benzylic, it's more stable. So uh, this reaction happens fairly quickly. And so, <clears throat> what we can do next. With this, for example, if we go ahead and find another chlorine molecule, we can go ahead and react with that. We're going to see that all sorts of fun stuff can happen with radicals. Yeah, it just sits on top. And that is going to be... We'll look at the geometry of that in just a little bit. But I just want to show a few more things of what's happening with the radicals. We have various uh, things that can happen with these. So what can happen now is that radical can go find something else to mess with. And the idea here is that radicals will just react with, with whatever. They will find something they want to react with and they will react with it. So now this one can say, aha, hello chlorine, I wish to be with you. And so by doing that, that radical can pair with the chlorine splitting the CLCL bond up, which produces this now produces another uh, chlorine radical. But look what we've done. We've taken Toluene, methylbenzene, you could say. 
and we have now put a chlorine on it. So we've taken an alkane. Alkanes don't do anything. They are chemically inert. And we have now turned it into an alkyl halide, which now we can say, ah, I can do all this fun stuff with. I can go ahead and do SN2 with this, SN1 with this. Can't really do E1 because there's nothing to eliminate, but or E2, but uh, you got fun stuff there. So now you can react this and do all your fun additional elimination reactions. So you can make fun little bits there. We're going to see that uh, there's other reactions that things can do. So this one was called halogen abstraction. Previously, we had hydrogen abstraction. We broke a CH bond and grabbed a hydrogen with our radical. This time, our radical is grabbing a halogen. It is grabbing a chlorine. Let's see, what else can we do? There's two more kind of uh, less common ones that we're going to see, but we'll take a look at an old like example here. That's just going to be a resonance, so let's um, let's not worry about that. Let's say we've got our chlorine bond, our chlorine radical again. We can interact with a pi bond as well. If we do that. Well, in this case, it doesn't really matter which one we put it on, but the arrows here are showing us that we're going to have one uh, electron from this pi bond attacking the chlorine, and the other electron goes onto the carbon. So that one's going to end up sitting this radical here, and we will have made a bond to the chlorine. This is just kind of addition. If we feel like it, we can do the opposite. We can go ahead and say, aha, hello, halogen. I'm going to now close back down again because I don't like you here. We can kick it out. Reforming this. Just reverse of the reaction above. This one is elimination. So I'm um, just showing you all the various things that we can do. So first thing, we can homolytically cleave. Wow, that's way up here. Homolytic cleavage is the first way to make a radical. And then what things that we can do with radicals, we can take hydrogens away, forming radicals. We can take halogens away, forming radicals. We can add things to pi bonds, forming radicals. We can eliminate forming radicals. And then the last thing we can do is couple. Two radicals put together, you can couple them. Doesn't have to be halogen radicals. Could be two of these guys. This could also be a coupling reaction. Okay, we'll fix that arrow. This would be a coupling reaction as well. So we have six things that, that deal with radicals, six kind of general mechanisms. 
homolytic cleavage. We have the uh, hydrogen abstraction, halogen abstraction, elimination, and addition to pi bonds. And then to get rid of radicals, we have coupling. So we can kind of group these into three different sets. We have initiation of a process, which will be our homolytic cleavage. Usually you use light or heat to get this to happen. I'm just going to actually leave the radical on it because that's really just what we're focusing on right now. So we get two chlorine radicals this way. Notice we have zero radicals to start, and then now we have two radicals. So the idea with initiation steps, if you're initiating a radical process, you're making radicals where you didn't have radicals before. And then the next kind of classification we have would be propagation steps. These we're going to have four different ones on. We're going to have our hydrogen or halogen abstraction and our addition to, to pi bonds or elimination. These are four different reactions, mechanisms, we can say, that are all propagating radicals. And let's take a look at one of them. So if we had the benzyl radical, we end up putting a chloride there, and we make a new radical. So notice here we have one radical making one radical. So these are propagation steps, because we are keeping the same number of radicals, we're just moving that radical around. We're moving it now to a chlorine where it used to be on a carbon. So uh, they, they move chlorines around, they propagate it, right? Initiation is how we get radicals in the first place. Once we have them, then we can start propagating them. And that's where most of the, the, the interesting chemistry happens. So uh, we end up just keep working with these. So those four reactions are all propagation steps, whichever they may be. This, in this case, it was halogen abstraction. But the point is you start with a radical, you end with one radical. No new radical, like we don't make, an, like we have the same number of radicals on both sides of the reaction. Previously, we had zero, we ended up with two, so we have more than we started with. That's initiation. Propagation, we have the same number. And then finally, we have a termination step, which is a coupling. And I'll just say we have this. where those will couple together. And in fact, I have too few carbons, one sec. There we go. This is a coupling. So we had to start two radicals. We end up with zero radicals. So we terminate the reaction. These things just happen in chains. So these are chain reactions. As soon as you initiate the process, once you start making radicals, they do all sorts of stuff. They abstract things, they add to things, they eliminate from things. They propagate themselves around, do sorts of crazy stuff. And then eventually, if two radicals happen to run into each other, they can terminate the reaction. So that's the idea. You take your chlorine, split it apart homolytically. They all go do their own thing. Or they may just come back together and terminate. You can do it with halogens too.
taking two chloride chlorine radicals, turn them into a chlorine molecule, Cl2. So these are kind of the six different mechanisms that we're going to have with these. All right, so any questions on any of those? So it's just like um, the mechanisms we had before where we, we classified different arrow types as nucleophilic attack, proton abstraction, um, what else did we do? Loss of a leaving group and then rearrangements, right? So here we have homolytic cleavage, halogen or hydrogen abstraction, two different ones there. Addition to a pi bond or elimination to make a pi bond. Two more there, and then coupling. Those are six different mechanisms we can say. And we'll look at some reactions of these. So those are the things radicals do. We can talk a little bit more about other things radicals do. This is a big one right here. Unlike carbocations, radicals do not do rearrangements. Only resonance. So carbocations, we saw they would move, meth meth they could do a methyl shift, a hydride shift, whatever they want to do, carbocations will do it to make themselves more stable, ring expansions, whatever. Radicals don't do that. Radicals, once they're there, they're stuck there uh, until they react. So um, they can resonate though, but they can't really do anything else. So if you have your, your benzyl radical, it can resonate into the ring, no problem. Your allylic one can re uh, resonate as well. So, um, but that's all you can do with these things. So by themselves, they cannot rearrange your molecules. So they are a bit safer in terms of the chemistry. Because if we saw that carbocations, we get all sorts of weird products, depending on what carbocation we make. If we start with a secondary one, we may end up making a tertiary product later, because we've moved a methyl group around, or we've moved to a different position, or we've expanded a ring. Like, very drastic things can happen with carbocations, but uh, radicals don't do that. So, lucky us. Geometry-wise, they are effectively planar. If we consider this all in a plane, I don't know if it's tert butyl radical here, just in a plane. However, there may be some evidence that it's really actually slightly pyramidal. But that's rapidly inverting. So it's going up and down. So a shallow pyramid. So, but it's effectively planar. So it may be a very slightly raised pyramid. So here's, let's see, flat, planar, here. If it's a shallow pyramid, it might look something like this. That's rapidly going like up and down. Overall, it's pretty much a plane. So these things effectively are sp2, which means when we add to radicals, we can add from either side. And so we're typically going to end up with a racemic mixture of stuff when we react radicals. If we were to take this dude, do some radical stuff with it, Give it a little bit of light. We're going to end up with a racemic mixture, probably. 
Although with chlorine, it's a little bit harder to tell because we get a mess of products typically. Um, but the idea here is that uh, we're going to end up with a mixture of products because this is sp2 the chlorine could have come from either side the chlorine could attack from above or it can attack from below Let's see if the blue it can attack from above or below so depending where we form the bond that will determine our stereochemistry equal probability from either side because it's effectively planar can attack from above or from below. And as a result, we end up with a racemic mixture. So we're going to see that we can halogate, halogenate alkanes, uh, which is the primary use of these uh, techniques here. And when we do so, we end up with a racemic mixture. So just keep that in mind for stereochemistry purposes. All right, so that's the idea. <clears throat> if we want to look at the mechanism of what's happening here, let's look at the mechanism. Of this kind of reaction. So first step for a radical mechanism must always be initiation. And with that, since we're using halogens, that's our typical uh, starting material, the mechanism for that starts with homolytic cleavage. So we are going to use that UV light. It's going to give us enough energy to split this uh, molecule into two radicals. So we end up with two chlorine radicals here. That's the initiation step. Initiation is always going to be homolytic cleavage. Heterolytic cleavage, by the way, let me just put that out there because we'll see this later on, but heterolytic, heterolytic cleavage would look something like this. It would be both electrons go just to one of them. And we end up with charged things. And we end up with separate things. This would be heterolytic cleavage. This is not a radical process. This is something we'll see later on. But uh, since we're talking about homolytic cleavage, cleaving equally, which gives us two neutral radicals. Heterolytic cleavage, on the other hand, will give you ions. Homolytic cleavage gives you radicals. Heterolytic cleavage gives you ions. So keep that in mind. So not something we're going to see in this, but uh, just putting that out there. So we've made our radicals. Now we're going to propagate them. So just note, we do not get heterolytic cleavage here, only homolytic cleavage. Um, with this, we're going to now propagate them. And since our goal is to chlorinate that position for this particular molecule, we're going to want to take a look at it. It's got two hydrogens now. One of those is going to be removed, right? We know we're replacing one of those hydrogens with the chlorine in our final molecule. So the first step of our propagation is we're going to go ahead and steal a hydrogen. This is a propagation step, so we should end up with a radical. And there it is. We make HCl. Remember, this here is hydrogen abstraction.
And now, this radical, uh, I'm going to just do it directly. We'll see its good friend chlorine nearby, and it's going to then uh, attack that one. So we're going to end up forming a bond between chlorine and carbon. And remember, this could attack from either side, above or below. racemic plus minus, <clears throat> and we make another chlorine radical, right? So it's still propagation. This one is halogen abstraction. So we have made our product of interest. We have made our product in the propagation steps. And now <clears throat> we will need to terminate our reaction because we can't just leave radicals around. So the last step in the mechanism is going to be termination. And typically here we have um, a couple of options. We have more of these things, finding some of these things. That's very descriptive, right? Uh, we have the butane radical and the chlorine radical. We could have two butane radicals or we could have two chlorine radicals. All three of these will be termination steps. And so we, we do end up with some weird products. And we are just making a bond between them. And so, <clears throat> in this case, we get another copy of our product. Doesn't really matter what stereochemistry, because remember it's racemic. We end up with this thing, which is a little bit bizarre. And then we end up with Cl2. So this is a weird side product here. And uh, so that's kind of a side product of this reaction. And this was kind of already present, the chlorine, and then we have more of our, our uh, ideal product. So in either case, we have to terminate the reaction by closing off potential radicals. And the radical species we had here were uh, chlorine radicals. We had the butane radicals. Those were the two radicals we made in our propagation steps here and here. I'm going to erase that actually. Those were the two radicals we made, so we have to terminate them. And either that's going to be them coming together, two of the same things coming together, or the separate things coming together. And uh, so we'll end up with, with our product. So that's the mechanism for this. So we make the radical first using homolytic cleavage, not heterolytic cleavage, homolytic cleavage gives us radicals. Those radicals can then abstract a hydrogen from our butane. <clears throat> Excuse me. That butane can then go find another chlorine molecule and take a halogen away from it, giving us a chlorinated product, making another chlorine radical. Notice, importantly, it doesn't just find a chlorine radical because that would be a termination step. It's important that when we show radical mechanisms that we distinguish our initiation, our propagation, and our termination steps. So we have to have three categories of, of things happening here. All right, and then so uh, our termination steps, we could get our product again. We could couple two butane radicals, or we could couple two chlorine radicals. So... Uh, whichever one we end up making. <clears throat> Overall, what happens, though, is we are going to take this thing, 
and we're essentially just substituting a hydrogen in. But in reality, we'll also get this one. Well, HCl is already here. And then minorly, we'll get that weird side product. <clears throat> Um, in homework and exams and stuff, you don't have to include this. Uh, but technically, that's another thing we're going to make. So we end up chlorinating either the secondary position or the primary position. We also make HCl as a byproduct of this. Again, we needed a little bit of light to get the uh, homolytic cleavage to happen. <clears throat> and so we're going to see that. If we uh, take a look at, where is this thing? Some interesting things to note <clears throat> is that we're really just going to be comparing chlorination and bromination. Those are the two more important ones. We'll see why in a little bit. We're going to see that, notice in this example, we have chlorine that could add to the secondary position or to the primary position on this butane. So we end up with two different chlorinated products. And so, how do we know which one we're going to end up getting? Well, this depends on the radical stability. For chlorination and bromination, we're going to see that they have different selectivities, and I have them here. Ratio-wise, this is the, the ratio you get of, of products when you do these sorts of reactions. Uh, and for bromine, I'm going to put that one out as well. We see here that bromine, look at these ratios, much High, higher ratios. Bromine is much more selective. Because if we take a look at, say, this butane example, we saw that we got both products, right? It doesn't matter where our chlorine ends up on carbon one or carbon two. Obviously, the other two carbons are just um, symmetry, so we don't have to worry about them. But if we look here, we can figure out what the distribution of this product of these products would be. If we want to consider what the distribution is going to be, we have four hydrogens that could be abstracted, leading us to uh, the secondary product. And we have six hydrogens that could lead us to the primary product. And so if we use these regiochemical uh, outcomes, these are statistical probabilities of uh, each position, we can see what the distribution is going to be. In this case, we have six hydrogens that, uh, that would be primary. And we have four hydrogens that are secondary. And so the, the product ratio that we get is going to be a 6 to 26. Nope, nope, nope. Six, 4 times 4 is 16 plus 2, 18. If I have my math right. So we're going to see that uh, we're going to get a 1 to 3 ratio of this dude to that dude. And I'm not even going to draw this pair of chemistry. It's going to be either wedge or dash plus minus. So we end up with a 1 to 3 ratio of those. So <clears throat> it's kind of a mess, right? We have... 
75% of our products will be the secondary one and the and 25% will be the primary one. And that's not that great because I mean that means we've lost a quarter of our what we wanted to make, right? So not the best. We're gonna see bromination is a little better. Um, let's see what this would be with bromination. Let's see what the product ratio would be with bromination. And then we'll look at why. So two options here. Again, we have six primary hydrogens and four primary secondary hydrogens. For bromine, it's a 1 to 82 ratio. That's expected. And so we see a 6 to 4 times 8, 32, 328 ratio, which is, I don't know, quite, quite high. But would we end up with like 2% uh, this guy? 98% this guy. Quite a bit better, isn't it? Bromine is much more selective as to where it's going to end up. Um, and so with this, we see that we had, with the chlorine, we had 25% this and 75% this, 3 to 1 ratio. And this we have a 6 to 300 ratio, roughly 2%, a little bit less actually. Uh, so more than 98% we're going to get the secondary one. And if we look at tertiary substrates, so let's say we have T-butyl, T-butane rather, what's interesting if we take this thing, so T-butane, We have options. We can either put the chlorine here, or we can put it on one of these end carbons. We get two products again. If we see the ratio, we have nine hydrogens that are primary, and we have one hydrogen that is tertiary. If we go ahead and take a look at these numbers, these numbers you will want to know, by the way. Don't memorize them, but like write them down on a post-it note and stick it on your wall. So um, we have a 5.1 for tertiary and a 1. So we see a roughly 2 to 1 ratio, roughly. And so we're going to end up with Actually, more of this product here. We're going to get roughly, I don't know, 66% this, 33% this. Roughly. I don't want to do the math, but it's roughly 2 to 1, right? 9 to 5, almost. It's 1.8, right? It's almost 2 to 1. But as a result, we get, that's the rough distribution we get. If we look at bromination, on the other hand... I'm going to draw this just a little bit differently. It really doesn't matter. It's all symmetrical, or it's all rotational. So bromine we could add as well. We have nine primary hydrogens. We have one uh, tertiary hydrogen. It's a 9 to 1,600 ratio, meaning we don't get that. 100% this. I mean, I'm rounding, of course, because it's, it's only 99.98% or something, but good enough. We only will get the tertiary substituted one. So uh, it's very much more selective as to where it goes. So chlorine is happy to go wherever fairly speaking, but the bromine is very much more selective as to which position it goes to. And what does this mean?
What does this mean? What does this actually tell us? What does this experimental evidence show us about what's happening here? Well, it tells us that because tertiary is the only product for bromination, that it's all about the stability of this. It, um, it, what's, what do I want to say about this? It speaks to the stability of the radical. What this is telling us is that this thing hangs around longer than this thing does, than the primary one. It exists for a longer time. I must say ex exists. The tertiary radical exists for a longer period of time than the primary one. We know that because the tertiary one is much more stable. <clears throat> and so, because the chlorine is able to react with it, the chlorine is able to react with, with the primary one, but the bromine can't. And so this must be something about kinetics then. Because bromine and chlorine relatively same, they're radical, if they're radicals, they're just going to react. But because... can react with the primary radical, it must react more quickly. than bromine does. Right, because we know both of these can be formed. We could form a primary radical, we could form a tertiary radical. And we have evidence that we form the primary radicals because we do see that as a product for chlorination. We do see that most of it is, in fact, the primary product. So we know we're forming a primary radical. But it's telling us that the bromine is too slow to react with the primary one. So it's only going to be able to react with the radical that's hanging around more for a longer duration. Because that primary radical is either going to go right back and steal its hydrogen away from chlorine, or it's going to just find a chlorine right away, or do something else. You could also have it attacking another butane, so it could totally happen. Um, but it's telling us that the bromine is much more slow. The chlorine is much faster than the bromine is at reacting. And so let's look at some thermodynamics here. All right, let's take a look at some thermodynamics. So first things first, Y'all thought we were done with this. Thankfully, though, we will see it can be relatively easier to talk about. So if we're looking at the thermodynamics of this process, we're taking, or bromine, or whatever, I'm just, any of these, they're all going to have the same idea. We're going to see that because these two are both, we're starting with two things, ending with two things, and we're not really doing too much, uh, we're not really making much more complicated molecules, we're going to say that because these are similar 
that this tells us delta s is about zero. So we're starting with two compounds, ending with two compounds. Remember that delta s increases if we end up making more compounds, uh -huh. That's especially if they're gaseous, uh, which all of these would be anyway. Uh, but if delta s is approximately zero, then then delta G is equal to delta H. And so we can look at delta H now, and we can look at bond forming things. If we look at this, oh God, that's ugly. Here, we'll do it this way, because it was prettier. If we're comparing these, and let's go ahead and take a look at the other one as well. Actually, I'm going to just put both products. Uh, no, I won't. Okay. We'll do the same for chlorine. Let's take a look at the bond dissociation energies. We'll look at the bond enthalpies of all of these because you thought you were done with thermochemistry. Remember for delta H, we can do it with Lewis structures by looking at bond enthalpies. Let's go ahead and I have the, the numbers for those around here somewhere. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. I have them here. Okay, bond uh, dissociation energies for here. So for carbon to chlorine, uh, we are looking at 351 kilojoules per mole, bromine 293. All right, and we remember that we looked at the bond dissociation energies earlier for some of these hydrogens, we saw that the tertiary one, uh, where was the tertiary one? Probably should have just consolidated all these numbers, honestly, there's so freaking many. All right, here's the tertiary one, uh, 381. And the primary one was, 450, 435. And then we also need our H2 uh, halogens. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> I promise we'll have all these uh, written out here. Uh, and then we have H to Cl and then H to Br. And we're going to see, we're going to calculate the delta H of these. And so we're, we're going to see what's going to happen. So H2CL uh, is 431. For BR, it's 368. And uh, let's see. And then we're BRBR BR is 193. CLCL is 243. All right. So remember that when we are doing delta H for these, we're always going to have uh, bonds breaking and bonds forming, right? So remember that delta H for bonds breaking is always positive. These are values for breaking bonds. Delta H for bonds being formed is going to be the negative one. It's always endothermic to break a bond. It's the same value exothermically to make a bond. So uh, if we're going to go ahead and, and see these, uh, remember that uh, if we're going to take a look at these, we can see for uh, the first one, let's take a look at the prior, or tertiary uh, carbon with chlorine. Remember that what's going to really happen here Because we're making CL, or we're using CL2. We're forming bonds and making bonds, right? So 
let's take a look at the, the energies here. If we're going to be breaking a CLC album, that's 243 kilojoules per mole. If we are breaking a CH bond that's tertiary, that's 381. And we're forming a CCL bond, which is 351. Negative, because that's what we're making. And then uh, we're going to have the uh, HCL, which is negative 431. So if we add all these things together, we could either do this uh, where we are taking all these positive values doing bonds break bonds breaking minus bonds forming or we can just add these all together with their signs already included if we do that bust out your handy dandy calculator so we're going to do this for all of them 381 plus 243 minus 351 minus 431 we get delta h is negative 158 kilojoules per mole. And since delta G equals delta H, this is an exergonic or spontaneous reaction. So we can fix that. So nicely exergonic reaction. Uh, if we do this with the primary one instead, for the primary one, we just have a higher when we have 435 instead. So plus 435 minus 381. I'm just going to do that for the primary one. For this guy, the delta H is negative 104. So I'm using, instead of 381 for the uh, CH here, I'm using 435. Right, which is our primary carbon to hydrogen bond. So uh, we see that it's still going to be uh, an exergonic reaction pretty, pretty strongly. If we take a look at the bromine one, let's take a look at this. So we've got 381 here. BRBR BR is 193, HBR 368, negative, and then CBR is negative 293. So let's go ahead and do this math here. 381 plus 193 minus 368 minus 293 we get negative 87. And if we do the same thing for the primary one, I'll just do that one. Okay. So uh, everything is the same here except this number jumps to 435. Everything else stays the same, 193 minus 368 minus 293. You can do that math. Negative 435, I'm sorry, positive 435, plus 193 minus 368 minus 293. We get for this negative 33. That's quite small, isn't it? So this process is still spontaneous, but it's much less so than it was for chlorine. So chlorine, they were both, in fact, higher or more exothermic, more exergonic than the, um, than the bromines one, bromine ones were. And so we have a thermodynamic reason that this is less likely to happen as we go on. These are our delta H values for these reactions. We see here that chlorination is much more energetically favorable uh, in either case. So it's going to happen more quickly because it's got less of an energy gap to overcome. We're going to see that the bromination one, we have a bigger energy gap to overcome. 
And if we try to take a look at the um, the delta H for iodine, we're going to see that it would in fact be positive, so it's not even going to happen at all. So uh, if we tried to do it iodination, we'll put this to fluorination, two reactive, explodes. We don't, we don't do fluorination. Iodination will be uh, non-spontaneous. We'll see that the delta G will be greater than zero for this. Uh, if you try to do the math, uh, we're going to see that we're not going to get iodination to happen at all. So um, this tells us stuff about the speed of the reaction as well. So if we're going to see uh, the chlorination, we're going to see this is strongly exothermic and it's got a relatively low activation energy. For bromination, it's uh, quite a different reaction coordinate. We have quite a much higher one, and we end up with a slightly less uh, exothermic reaction, right? We saw the chlorination was much more exothermic than the bromination was. Delta H here would be whichever, what was it, negative 33, we'll say. We'll do the primary one. The delta H here for primary was what, negative 104 for uh, the chlorination product. And so we're going to see here that the activation energies for chlorine is much lower. So I shouldn't use that color, it's too, too bright. Remember, activation energy is the barrier you have to overcome to get your reaction to happen. So uh, because of that, your activation energy is being so different, we're going to see that this one will be much slower. Or you need high temperatures to make it to happen. So you've got to give it more energy there. All right, so um, I hope I drew this correctly. No, I, I, it's not obvious. Um, I'm going to redraw this one a little bit, just a little bit to make it a little bit more obvious. So I'm going to keep that. That's not obvious enough. OK, let's try this again. There we go. So um, we're going to see here that our um, first step in the reactions are going to look differently as well. We're going to see that when we have chlorine and hydrogen interacting versus bromine and hydrogen interacting, if you remember that Hammond postulate idea we talked about way back when, if the first step or chlorination is exothermic. Remember, exothermic ones mean your transition state will resemble your reactants. So that means the transition state And here's our radical. That bond between carbon or hydrogen and chlorine is just beginning to form in the transition state in between these two. So our transition state with its double dagger not equals to sign is going to look much more uh, like the reactants will be. And for chlorine, for bromine, because that uh, we see that the intermediate, these aren't my normal colors, there we go. The intermediate here 
is much higher in energy for the bromination. And we're going to see that the transition state for this process is going to look very different. We see here that the bond is barely broken. Or, and the HCl part is not even formed yet. And in the other case, we're going to see, because it's endotherm, or this step is endothermic, we're going to see that this transition state looks like uh, where we have the CH is almost completely broken. And the HBr bond is almost formed. So uh, we could also use this information to talk about the transition states. So just the idea of the bromine being slower also energetically less favorable. Uh, because we know it's slower, that means that it has the higher energy gap to overcome. And we're going to see uh, that we're going to end up having the transition states looking different. So the transition states for these reactions, where the bromine is abstracting the um, hydrogen, we have to consider, is this transition going to happen more easily or more difficultly, dare I say, uh, in a primary or tertiary case? So by the time that this reaction is overcoming its hump, the, the barrier to stop it from happening, the chlorination one, it still looks like the reactants. So there almost is not even a radical here. And so as a result, chlorine is less specific because our transition state is the reactants almost. And so because the transition state doesn't have a strong radical, it's kind of happier. Dare I say that? Um, whereas the transition state for the bromine, this is almost a radical. And so we have, because in order to even get to this spot on our reaction diagram, we're almost at a radical already. So we need that radical to be much more stable than the radical in the transition state for chlorination. That's the point of all this stuff. So this needs to be a more stable radical then is necessary for chlorination. Because the chlorination one, it resembles the reactants. And the reactants is not a radical. The intermediate is the radical. With this one, with the one, with the bromination, it resembles the product, which is your intermediate. And so your transition state needs to be stabilized. So the best way to do that is make sure that it's going to be the most stable radical you can form. So as a result, the bromine is going to have that 1600, you know, statistical preference for having the tertiary one. So just knowing this, we have a lot of information about um, kinetics, which tells us all about the mechanisms. So that's why the bromine will selectively prefer to be on the tertiary position. And again, a secondary better than, than a primary. So 1 to 82 to 1600. That's the ratio we're looking at. So much, much more defined in our bromination example. Whereas the chlorination, it's like, okay, whatever. Transition state's kind of just the plain old reactants anyway. The radical's not going to exist for very long, so not a problem. All right, so that's the idea here. 
So how's that looking? The, the whole point of all this, by the way, <laughs> was just to show you why we have these preferences. So that's why chlorination is less selective than bromination is. Fluorination even more reactive, um, barely even has a preference for one over the other. So, questions on this? I was honestly expecting more questions, but that's okay. talk about more of these things later. Okay, well that's all I wanted to cover today, so uh, next week we'll continue on. Uh, it's a short chapter, so we just have a few more things left to talk about, and, um, and then we'll go from there. So um, one more thing though, uh, just so we are aware, I will try and grade your exams by Friday. The reason for that is because Saturday is the drop deadline. I think. Or is it Friday? I will double check. Um, if it's Friday, I will try and have them graded as early on Friday as possible. And uh, because I want you to have as much information as is necessary if you're going to determine if you need to drop the class or not. Um, so it's um, the decision, of course, will be yours. Uh, you can talk to me about it if you need to. Um, if you are particularly considering dropping, shoot me a message, um, and I will try and put priority on grading yours first so that um, you have as much time as possible to make that determination, um, because I believe it is actually Friday the 29th. I remember seeing that as the date. So um, we'll uh, make sure that we get there. All right. Um, and otherwise, we'll go from there. So... Um, of course, your grades are going to potentially be lower based on what happened on exam one, right? So um, if you're thinking about dropping, let me know. I'll try and grade yours first. Uh, sorry, if you got like an A on the first exam, I'm probably going to grade yours last because you're probably not thinking about dropping. So um, just want to give th that information out there. So just remember that deadline is coming up very soon. So if you need to drop the class because uh, it's too much work or, or whatever it may be, um, got to make that decision very soon. Okay, so um, talk to me, let me know, and we'll go from there. All right, so that's all I wanted to cover today, so, uh, so we're good. So I will go ahead and upload this, and uh, then we'll be good. All right, awesome. Take care then. Uh, enjoy your weekend study well. Do your spectroscopy. Don't forget about that. Um, <clears throat> this Friday is not probably an option, but next Friday we can do some spec uh, review and go through some problems that are driving you guys nuts. But I do recommend that y'all um, work together on these. Share your your uh, findings in, in Discord. Oh, I have to flip this sideways to post the notes. Um, so make sure you, you're doing that as well. So uh, definitely a good idea to collaborate on the spectroscopy aspect because that's going to be the majority of exam three. So uh, beware of that, okay? So that's the idea. Okay, so that's posted. Alrighty. So um, have fun. We'll go on to that. All right. See you guys next time.